Hello all the crazy people out there, my name is Michael, I like wizards and dragons and making games, and welcome back to 3D Collisions and Game Maker. So last I left off, we had just finished uh, implementing fast, or at least fast-ish, 3D Collisions against Triangle Meshes, which I think are the, uh, the part of 3D Collisions that a lot of people were expecting when I said I was going to do this. It only took like 18 videos. And today we're going to start looking ahead to creating entire 3D Collision worlds. So I think I said at the end of the last video that, um... I was thinking about doing matrices or something this next time, and I decided to hold off on that. Uh, matrices are kind of their own, their own whole entire thing, and in any case, they're probably going to be used mostly in things that I'm going to be doing a lot later anyway. So instead, let's do something relatively easy. So a lot of you have probably looked at the, um, looked at the octree structure that we were using for uh, accelerating triangle collisions, and you probably had the thought occur to you, uh, it is probably a... Reasonably simple and straightforward to apply the same uh, the same practice of using an op tree to not only a triangle mesh but to other shapes as well. And if that did occur to you, if, if you did have that thought, uh, you are correct. And as it turns out, that is exactly what we are going to be doing in the coming weeks. At the moment, in this here test world that I have set up, um, the this entire this entire world is just a a big old list of um, of various collision shapes. And it definitely performs better than a big old list of triangles, because pretty much anything performs better than a big old list of triangles. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't scale super well. There's a thousand objects in this world, and it would be nice if we had a way to, um, to organize all these into a hierarchy as well, so that we didn't have to go to the effort of checking collision for the player against things that are way off in the distance. And uh, in very much the same way that we did with the, uh, the triangle collision meshes. But first, before we deal with that, there is a little bit of extra housekeeping that I would like to get out of the way. So, right now, we have just a collection of individual collision shapes that we are checking against each other. It would be really nice if we could instead have a single type of collision object that we could uh, use for all shapes and treat the same way, without having to say, for example, sphere.checkab or ab.checkplane or whatever. Um, we don't need to know which types of shapes we are checking against each other. Uh, all collision types are just going to be treated the same way. As you can imagine, if you have a big game world of 3D objects that are all interacting with each other, uh, there's a good chance that some of them are going to have different collision shapes than others. You might have a couple planes, you might have a couple spheres, you might have a couple um, later on capsules for things like NPCs and whatever. And it would be really nice if you didn't have to keep track of which is which and you could just treat all objects the same way. So the thing that I'm trying to avoid, if I were to go and create myself a new script, and I'm going to call this call underscore world, because that is what we're going to be working towards. Uh, you, you could do, and this is what I'm doing my best to avoid, is to have a single function that's like check anything, and it'll take two shapes as a parameter, shape one, shape two, and uh, what it'll do to figure out which uh, collision detection uh, functions it needs to call is something like, hello? Game maker, if uh, instance of shape one equals equals call point return shape two dot check point uh, shape one, uh, and then if that's not the case, if the instance of is going to equal call sphere uh, call the ch check sphere method on it instead. Yeah, this is what we don't want to do. Even if you don't use the instance of uh, function to like get the name of the actual like struct constructor, um, which is awful in many different ways. Uh, maybe you might attach like a, I don't know, a type, a type variable to each um, to each collision shape and check that instead. Uh, regardless, we are not going to be doing that. I I really don't like uh, having to hard code things like that, and we're going to be um, coming up with something that is at least. Uh, at least in my opinion, a little bit more computationally elegant. The second thing that I'm going to want to account for in the near-ish future is being able to reference back to the um, like the, either the game maker instance or another game object that uh, is represented by a collision shape. So right now, we have our loose uh, our loose collection of collision shapes, but they can't refer back to any game object. So you can't collide with, uh, for example, you can't collide with an axis line bounding box and say, okay, this is a tree versus okay, this is a house. Or, okay, this is a, if you were to get really fancy, this axis on bounding box represents a collision zone, which once I step into it, it should teleport me to another part of the map or something like that. We don't have anything like that right now. 
and it would be really nice if we could, uh, you could fix this by just adding to the constructor something like, um, in addition to the usual pl parameters of position and radius and, and whatever, you could add another parameter that's like, uh, reference or something like that, and then self dot reference equals reference, uh, set it to a struct variable, and then when you, when you, uh, somewhere else in the game, try to instantiate a call sphere or something like that, you could say new call sphere, position, radius, whatever those happen to be, and then the reference could be like self.id or something if it's a game maker object or whatever. Um, that's valid. There's nothing really wrong with that if you wanted to do it like that, but I'm, uh, I'm not going to anyway because the solution that I'm going to come up with for the first problem is going to, um, is going to apply to the second problem as well. Similarly, uh, when we do get around to doing matrix transforms on shapes, it's uh, it's going to be nice to be able to attach a transform matrix to each and every one of these shapes. And again, you could attach um, you could attach that data to each shape as a, a parameter to its constructor. I'm not going to. You might also want to do something to the effect of uh, allowing the programmer to filter collisions against each other so that you can detect collisions with certain groups of objects but not others. And uh, once again, you could pass that as a parameter to the constructor, but what I'm going to do instead is hopefully a little bit more all-encompassing, and that is going to be creating another struct, uh, which is a wrapper for these shapes, which is going to be function, uh, I'm going to call it call object. And this is going to take a few parameters to its constructor. Uh, one is going to just be the shape, so any given point or sphere or ab or whatever, uh, so there's just going to be the shape that we're using, uh, there's going to be the reference which is going to be an instance ID or a reference to a struct which represents the player or an NPC or whatever. And uh, that's actually going to be it for now. I will, uh, I will attach the other things that I mentioned uh, later on. If you've used P3DC in the past for Game Maker, precise 3D collisions that uh, someone wrote way back in the Game Maker 8 days, uh, you've probably seen a concept similar to this, uh, being able to attach a user ID or some other type of reference to a um, to an object. If you've used the Venomous Bullet DLL for uh, 3D collisions, that's a little bit more recent. That's basically a game maker wrapper for the Bullet Physics Library. Uh, same thing. So let's get down to business. I'm going to define myself a method. I'm going to call it static check, check object. It's going to be uh, a function. This function is going to take one argument going to be another object like this. This is going to be the only method that this uh, that this struct has for checking for collisions against other object types. Uh, we're also going to have a separate method for a static uh, check ray is going to be equal to a function function uh, which takes a ray as an input parameter as well as a hit info struct uh, which we have been using to collect additional information about uh, ray cast hit detections. But otherwise, that's going to be it. You could make the argument that you also want to do a uh, static check line as a, uh, as a sort of supplement to, to the array cast, but I think for most practical purposes, you could get away with treating a, a line cast as either an object or a ray cast, depending on what you need it for. So I'm going to not include it today for the sake of time. And if you would like to do it yourself, uh, you hopefully have the, have the knowledge to do it yourself uh, without too much trouble. So this, on its own, doesn't really solve the problem of needing to figure out which types of objects you're checking for collision against each other. It kind of just kicks the problem that I posed at the beginning of the video down the road a little bit, and uh, you could very easily just do it here if instance of object dot shape equals whatever. You could just do that here, uh, but we could also uh, go back into the call shapes script and define a, a couple a couple of additional methods or really I should just say one additional method in a couple of different places uh, this is going to be static check object equals function it's going to take an object as a parameter and it's going to just be one line of code uh, return and remember these objects these uh, these call objects uh, they have a um, they have an existing collision shape as one of their instance variables, so we could just say return uh, object dot shape dot check point against self. And this might look like it doesn't really accomplish much, but since each collision shape already knows what it is, 
and doesn't have to be told by you, the programmer. Hey. Uh, you could take any old object, whether that's an object containing a sphere or a plane or a triangle mesh or whatever. Uh, you could take any old object. Uh, you could look at its shape, its shape property, and you could say whatever that object type is, uh, we're going to be checking uh, for collision against a point, and that point is going to be ourselves. And this does away with the need for an entire big if-else uh, for checking the type of each individual shape. And once we implement this particular method for all of the existing collision shapes, uh, so the sphere is going to do the same thing, but instead of saying object.shape.checkpoint, we're going to say object.shape.checksphere. Uh, same for the axis aligned bounding box, same for the plane. And since you probably don't need to see me typing that out for every single uh, collision shape, I just, I just went ahead and did that. You can see the changes here. I did it for every collision shape type except for rays. Rays are special. Uh, rays are going to be dealt with on their own. Uh, that includes collision line, by the way. We have a collision line check object as well. So if this is a little bit too, like, if this is a little bit too object-oriented happy for your tastes, because I know that some people like object-oriented programming, like, a lot, and then there are some people who think that object-oriented programming is the worst thing ever, and you should never ever use it if you don't have to. You could go and do, uh, in the collision object that check object, uh, what I said I was trying to avoid at the beginning and just do a big if-else tree. Uh, it would work, and the, uh, the end result will be the same as what I'm going to get here. It's just, I, I just get nightmares thinking about big if-else trees like that, and I'd rather avoid it if I can. Hey. So now when we want to detect collision from one object to another, we can simply say return, um, self.shape.checkObject against the other object, and we are good to go. So there's one thing that can happen sometimes if you're dealing with a big Super Mario 3D collision world, and that is that you try to accidentally detect collision with one object against itself, and uh, as you can imagine, if you try to do that, you are 100% of the time going to say that these two objects are colliding, uh, assuming that you've implemented your collision checking math correctly. And most of the time, that is not actually what you want. You don't want the player to detect collision against themselves, for example. You don't want, like, an enemy's, like, an enemy's collision box to detect collision against itself. That would be a little bit unfortunate. So I'm just going to add an additional check at the top of this uh, check object method that says if object equals equals self return false, just to ensure that that will never happen. And there's a few other things that you might do that are similar to this line uh, that you can do to fend off collision checks before they happen, such as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, collision filtering using masks, but I'm going to get to that later. I was already hoping this video would be a little bit on the shorter and simpler side, and it's already taken longer than I thought it would, so... Anyway, coming down here to the check ray method, this is going to be pretty similar. Uh, we're going to say self.shape.check ray against, instead of just any other arbitrary object, uh, we can do the ray and we can do the hit info. Uh, we don't have to do the, the fancy like object oriented tricks to, to have each collision shape detect the proper collision against the object because uh, we already know the shape of one of the inputs here and that is the ray. Uh, we can just say uh, whatever shape happens to be contained within our object, we're just going to check it against array, including the hit info struct. So in a few weeks, when I get around to doing another uh, 3D collision world demo like this, uh, each of the uh, individual objects that are in the scene, whether that's the uh, the player or all the trees or the floor, uh, these are going to be represented by collision objects, which contain a shape rather than just individual shapes that are scattered around. Uh, also. As I mentioned, uh, right now the collision detection in this demo, if you recall, is just uh, handled via a big old a big old list of collision shapes, and we are also going to be organizing that into a hierarchy to make it a little bit more efficient. You can see that with a thousand trees in the scene, uh, things are starting to slow a little bit to a crawl, which we do not want. Simple shapes like cubes and spheres and whatever are definitely better than checking for triangles, but uh, again, if we can make this whole thing perform better, we should definitely do that. So I'm going to leave this here for today. Hopefully you understand why these 13 lines of code plus whatever I added to the, uh, the shapes file, uh, why these are important, but also at the same time it shouldn't be too difficult because, um, again, I, uh, the last couple of these 3D collision videos have been on the complex side and I'd like to, uh, once in a while make something that's, uh, that's not quite as complicated. And also I'd really like to spend less than like six hours editing one of these videos one of these days, hey. uh, between you and me. 
Next time we're going to organize a bunch of objects into a collision world, and then after that it's time to bring it into a demo world. So, my name is Michael, I like wizards and dragons and making games. If you want the code for this, look for the GitHub repository down in the video description. Do I want to try to break this up into two commits? Yeah, sure. GitHub Desktop recently, in an update, added a little warning in case your, like, commit message goes over 50 characters, and I feel like it's personally judging me ever since it started doing that. Um, specifically, look for the zero point... I'm not trying to do that. Specifically, look for the 0.18 release uh, for this week's progress. I've been slacking on, like, making each and every one of these things an individual release. I've been trying to get more on top of that lately. Anyway, I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute towards these videos being made, look for links to that in all the usual places. You could see some fun things like, uh, like your name in the credits, that sort of thing. About once a month, I make a feature plans post. And if you're pledged, you can see what videos I'm hoping to have out, uh, in the, in the next few weeks. Otherwise, I try to post about two game dev videos a week, uh, one tutorial tutorial like this, and one let's make a game. Currently, that is a bullet hell. I hope you all found this useful, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Zenjamin, Then Nothing Happened, Square Crow, Syndra Larson, Posho, Gunnar Clovis, Game Maker, Emily Coyo, Edward Holt, DJ Gibbles, and Army Umbrester for supporting these videos. If you want to see your name in the credits or hear yourself shouted out at the end like this, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.